encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. Welcome to the podcast where our goal is to walk with Jesus every day. This is Today with Jesus. I'm Robert Hatfield. And I'm Dan Winkler. Thank you for being part of our study today. And if you're new to our podcast today with Jesus, we want to welcome you in a special way. We have tried for, Robert, is this season number seven? This is number seven. Wow, I can't believe it. For seven seasons, we've tried to make this podcast very unique and very helpful. Unique in that we're not sharing thoughts or rather opinions. We're not trying to be political, culturally relevant or irrelevant, whatever. We just want to get into the Bible and make an explanation of what we're reading and what we're seeing. And then not only make an explanation of Scripture, but turn around and make an application of that same Scripture to our lives and do it through a very special filter, and that filter would be Jesus Christ, because through all that we're trying to do, we want Jesus to live before us and in us, and we want to try to encourage each of us to live for Him. And we just want to welcome you if you're new, and if you have been with us for all seven seasons or for the majority of them, Thank you for continuing to make our podcast a part of your regular Bible study. We hope and pray that it's been uh, of help to you. Mm -hmm. It certainly has to me, Robert, and thank you for blessing my life week after week with these episodes. Tell us what we're doing this season. Just Mm -hmm. kind of remind us again. Yeah, well, we're walking through the book of Acts. We started last season, season six. And uh, there's just too much there to cover in 15 or 20 episodes. And so we've carried that over now. We're in our second season in the book of Acts, and we're looking at it specifically through the lens of the Jesus they knew. Let's get in touch with with their idea, that with their perception of who Jesus is, and then we can use that as we make application to fuel our own faithfulness to the Lord in our life with Christ. And so right. uh, it's really been a neat study. And it we has. find ourselves today uh, in Paul's third missionary journey. You you said right before we started, we're really moving along. And for that matter, so was Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We began the third missionary journey, actually, don't yeah, we, here in the latter right. part of chapter 18. In fact, I believe our plans today are to turn to that last paragraph in chapter 18, focus on a man that was introduced to us in our last episode, and then step into and proceed through chapter 19 in the city of Ephesus. Why don't we begin uh, today by thinking about this gentleman we know as Apollos, right here in the last paragraph of chapter uh, 18. Uh, Before we look at Apollos, I want to tell a story, Robert, and then ask you if you'd read that paragraph. The story is told about uh, a youth minister that was trying to impress upon his young people the concept of zeal. And so to do so, they were out at a campgrounds, and they had a big uh, campfire going, and he took a poker, uh, and he stuck the poker into the, the hot embers of the campfire. And he went on and talked about enthusiasm and zeal and fervor. And, and then after a while, he pulled the poker out of the campfire. And of course, the tip of it was red hot itself. And then he explained, he said, now, before the poker was in the fire. Now, the fire is in the poker. Mm. And that is zeal. We are in Christ Jesus, if we're Christians, he said. But zeal is when Jesus is in us, and other people can't help but see him and see his heart in us. That's enthusiasm. That's being on fire for Jesus. I love that little story. It reminds me that I'm to be fervent in spirit, boiling in heat, boiling in spirit, serving the Lord, as I find in Romans chapter 12. 
When we come to the last paragraph, Robert, of Acts 18, we read about a man who was like that. I'd like for you to read the paragraph and then make some comments about Apollos, Mm -hmm. and then it'll be about time for us to get into chapter 19. Would you read that for us? Yeah. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Okay, wonderful. Just on sidebar, here are some words that summarize Apollos in my mind. First of all, there's the word speaker. He was an eloquent man. Literally, he was a man of words. Second, scripture. He was competent. Some translations say mighty in the scriptures. Third, spirit. This passage says he was fervent in spirit. Fourth, study. He was willing to sit down with Aquila and Priscilla and study a Bible subject in which he was inaccurate uninformed. And then the fourth or final word, the fifth word, is sermons. He loved to preach, and he uh, did so powerfully, refuting the Jews, showing again by the scriptures that Jesus is or is the Christ. So those are five words that just uh, in passing we might use to summarize Apollos. But for my thoughts or for our thoughts for the next few minutes, I want us to focus on the way the Holy Spirit describes him. Fervent in spirit. The fire is in the poker. Mm-hmm. The, the, the fire of enthusiasm burned in the heart of Apollos. Now, Robert, I look. <clears throat> Apollos is the only man, the only individual in all of the New Testament that is described as fervent. Mm. I was blown away by that. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I in Romans 12 are told, be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. James tells us it's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much, according to the uh, American Standard King James versions. So we're to be people of fervor, but only one person in all of the New Testament is described as fervent. It's not Paul, although he spoke of his zeal, and the word zeal translates a word in the same word family, but Paul is never called fervent. He writes about his zeal as a Pharisee in Philippians 3. It's not the Corinthians. We read in 2 Corinthians 7 and 9 how that they were zealous for Paul and zealous for penitence and zealous for giving, but not one of Uh, these Corinthians are singled out as being people of fervor. We read about the Roman Pharisees in Romans chapter 10, how they had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. But again, not one of them is singled out. The It's not Paul, it's not Peter, it's not the Pharisees uh, of Rome, it's not the Corinthians, even Jesus Jesus is not ever described as fervent. One time he acted in a way where people's minds went back to Psalms and the passage that says, zeal for my father's house has consumed me. But Jesus was never specifically described as one fervent in spirit. Only Apollos is thus described. That's astonishing. What I want to do for the next very few minutes is to see what zeal or a fervent spirit did for or to Apollos. First, looking at these words that you just read so beautifully, zeal helped Apollos change his life and his religion. 
a zeal for Jesus helped uh, Paulus change his life and his religion. Now, it tells me that Apollos was a Jew, verse 24, a Jew named Apollos. But I end up this paragraph, and this Jew is con uh, is refuting Jews. And this Jew, in verse 24, has come to believe in, be converted to, and is now preaching Jesus as the Messiah of Old Testament prophecy. So here is a change in religion. Still further, I read in this context how that Apollos only knew initially the baptism of John. So apparently John the baptizer is the one that converted this Jew to a faith in one who was coming named Jesus. And he, he came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah as initially introduced to him through John. But his preaching about baptism was inaccurate he had to be corrected, and he was willing to be corrected. Therefore, another change. It was zeal for Jesus that helped Apollos change his life and change his religion. Here's a second thought. Zeal made Apollos, made Jesus the focal point of Apollos' life. Remember, he was a student of John the Baptizer. And if we went back, and we will here after we get into chapter 19, because the context encourages us to, if we were to go back in thought to the ministry and to the message of John the Baptizer, it was all about Jesus. He came to prepare the way for the Lord and to make his paths straight. And so John is often called the forerunner of Jesus. Well, here was a man who was schooled by John the baptizer to focus his attention on Jesus as the Messiah. So here is zeal helping Apollos change his life and his religion for Jesus. Here is Apollos' zeal making Jesus the focal point of his life. Here's a third thought. Zeal drove Apollos to the scriptures where he saw Jesus. He was mighty, competent in the scriptures. And uh, this is just a sidebar and a thought on my part. I I'm inclined to believe that the word scriptures here is a reference to a particular translation of the Old Testament scriptures, that being the Greek translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament scriptures. We call that the Septuagint. And we, I believe that because the Septuagint was actually translated years before Apollos, in his hometown, the hometown of Alexandria. Again, verse 24, he was a native of Alexandria. So he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had spent time with his Old Testament and perhaps with his, uh, his Greek translation of Old Testament scripture, and he knew it backwards and forwards, and it led him to Jesus. Then finally, zeal moved Apollos to talk about Jesus and do so all of the time. It tells us that he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus there in verse 25. And the verbs used carry this idea of something that he did persistently. He just couldn't say enough about Jesus. He couldn't quit talking about Jesus. Jesus was uh, uh, someone that just totally encapsulated and captivated the heart of Apollos. And thus we could say, the poker is in the fire, but the fire is in the poker. Here was a man that was a Christian. He became a Christian, converting to Jesus from Judaism. He was in Jesus, but Jesus was also in him. So here is a man that was fervent in spirit. I, I guess I'm led to ask, am I that way? Am I fervent in spirit? Well, am I willing to make the changes that I find in Scripture? Am I zealous for Jesus enough to make proper changes to be what He wants me to be? 
Is Jesus the focal point of my life to where I make decisions based upon how my decision will help me exalt my Lord and glorify my Heavenly Father? Does my zeal for Jesus drive me to read my Bible and see in my Bible what I can find about Jesus? And does my zeal for Jesus encourage me to talk about Him all of the time? When was the last time this week you took pause and let the name of Jesus moisten your lips in talking to others? So these are questions I need to ask stemmed from or gleaned from the example of Apollos to help me put a finger on the pulse of my fervor, my enthusiasm. I am, uh, maybe I need to be admonished like those of Laodicea, be zealous and repent. Maybe I need to make some changes to become more and more like Apollos. What a wonderful example of someone who loved Jesus and lived every day saying by his lifestyle and his fervor, today is for Jesus. Mm. Today I'm living with Jesus. Boy, that's the way we need to be. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get into chapter 19. I just wanted to share some thoughts about Apollos. Before we do that, chime in on that, Robert. Help well, me I'm some. Just, it is such a rare combination to have someone who is so talented, but who is also humble enough to be teachable or mm-hmm. to be taught. And uh, I, like you pointed out, it, it just goes back to where his motivation was. It, you know, his fervor was in Jesus. So <laughs> he, he wasn't fervent for, you know, uh, personal popularity or building a following on his own or even being known as a, a powerful or popular speaker, uh, an influencer in, in uh, <laughs> contemporary uh, parlance, but at the same time just to uh, to be someone who wanted to follow Jesus and therefore uh, a willingness to change when when uh, called upon to do so. Right. And so uh, uh, that that makes him truly unique in a lot of ways. Right. And and hopefully we can learn from his example That's it. and yeah. be unique ourselves. Right. Let's get into chapter 19. In chapter 19, we really find three basic sections. And um, I, I think that we are going to march today under the moniker of Jesus, the name that will change everything. And we see a whole lot of change going on, or a call for change at least, all through Acts chapter 19. Mm -hmm. As we did in this paragraph about Apollos, the man who changed from Judaism to Jesus, and a man who changed from an inaccurate teaching on baptism to an accurate teaching on baptism to be with Jesus. But we see these changes now that are called on, are called for rather, in chapter 19. Let me read the first seven verses, and we will come to um, the first of three sets and um, a call for change and change that took place. And then I want you to comment on these seven verses for us. And I'm going to sit back and I'm going to drink my coffee and just learn. (laughs) Oh, wow. All right. (laughs) Here we go. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, he hadn't gone to Ephesus yet as he was in that last paragraph. While he was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. Now, before you start commenting, uh, Robert, 
I have some questions for you. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, I, I, what What was the ministry of John all about? Mm-hmm. So, you know, John is given uh, is is. Uh, demonstrated he's he's flat out called the forerunner of Jesus uh that goes back to prophecies that had even been made about him in passages like uh what is it Isaiah chapter 40 and and passages like that uh the one the voice of one who cries in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his paths straight and when John comes the primary message at least the way it's summarized in the gospels is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand uh, it is John who's, uh, uh, from whose mouth comes phrases like this, I am not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ whom you seek. In fact, he says, I'm not worthy to even unlatch the sandal from his feet. Uh, in John chapter 1, seeing Jesus from a distance, John said to his own disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. In my mind, he was pointing toward Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when there were moments, I think preceding in John 1, that context, when there were moments when they asked him, John the Baptist, are you are you the one that we're seeking? And I suppose I could see why there would be some confusion on the part of some Jews who knew the Messianic prophecies and who were mm-hmm. waiting for that time. But John was very clear. He, he never once misled anyone with the impression that he was the one, the Messiah, but instead continually pointed to Jesus. And so... John is there just to prepare the way, you know, when, mm-hmm. when that time was coming. There was a sense in which the whole Old Testament had pointed to this, but John was sent at just the right point in history when uh, Jesus' ministry was very soon to begin on earth uh, that John would, would begin to preach and, and uh, to point people toward Jesus, the Messiah. So he would say, the kingdom of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is at hand, yeah. And then he would say uh, his ministry was to prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I I read that there in uh, Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. I like to say that his ministry can be summed up in two words, repair and prepare. Mm. Repair the way you're thinking. Repent, change the way you are thinking, and start thinking about the kingdom of God of heaven is he almost here and then he prepared the way for Jesus now here's my second question to you uh what was the baptism of John all about so i, I know mm. that his preaching his his message or ministry was all about preparing for Jesus and the kingdom that belongs to Jesus but what about his baptism talk to me about that mm-hmm. Well, John did preach baptism, and there were folks who would come out to him. You know, John was out there in the wilderness, and he was kind of a a man among men, you know, wearing the camel's hair and eating the locusts and wild honey and all that stuff. Uh, I can see the camel's hair, but that's a funky culinary diet, I'm telling you. (laughs) I am not going to eat bugs. Evidently, there were individuals who would who would come out to him, you know, being intrigued by the things that he was teaching and preaching. Yes. And so um, uh, there uh, along the Jordan River, uh, John would assist people in immersion or in baptism, and that's why we call him the Baptist or the baptizer, right? because that's, that's what he did. Uh, we know uh, from, uh, is it Luke's account, um, that uh, John's baptism was a baptism certainly of you know he had called people to repentance and mm-hmm. even for remission of sins yes. during its time yeah let me let me read mark one for us okay you comment on here uh it says the beginning of the gospel of jesus christ the son of god as it is written in isaiah the prophet behold i send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his path straight of course that's a reference to john's uh message and ministry as you just uh, uh, referenced earlier. Then it says in verse four, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Baptism, there's an immersion. 
baptism of repentance. There's contrition because godly sorrow leads to repentance, we read in 2 Corinthians. And then for the forgiveness of sins, there is remission. So an immersion based upon contrition for the remission of sins. How's that for a three-point sermon? what you did there. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. It's just (laughs) terrible, isn't it? The preacher in you just has to bleed out every now and then. But the point is, the point is, his baptism was a baptism getting people ready for Jesus. And mm-hmm. this is a just a segue into a sidebar. If John's baptism prepared people for the ministry of Jesus and John's baptism was an immersion, shouldn't we believe that Jesus' baptism, mm-hmm. the one he requires, is an immersion? That's a good point. And if his baptism is one based upon... Uh, uh, predicated upon contrition and repentance, shouldn't we think that the the baptism that Jesus requires is the same? And if his baptism was for the taking away of sins, shouldn't we think that the baptism that Jesus requires of us is the same? An immersion mm. in water, of course, based upon contrition, repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. That's John's baptism. But you turn to Acts as we have been for the last uh, season and a half. (laughs) Yeah. And and you see people are doing just that. They are being baptized, immersed because they want to change from the way they used to be, even the way they used to believe. And they want to be forgiven. Mm. It's just amazing. Now, This, I said two questions, but I have a third one for you, (laughs) and it kind of bleeds into this context. Uh, What was different about the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus, as we could say, call it? The baptism of John Mm -hmm. in contrast to the baptism of Jesus. Well, first of all, like you say, John was there in a preparatory role. Yes. Uh, in many ways, John bridged the gap between the period of the law of Moses and the period when the law of Christ was enacted. And the book of Hebrews tells us that that law or testament took effect when the testator or the one who made that law died. And so, you know, we're living under the time of the law of Christ today. Uh, part of the issue, and I think part of the thing that's at play here in Acts 19, is the reality that John's ministry, and thus the uh, power, if you will, of John's baptism, was short-lived and designed to be that way. It was preparatory to point to Jesus. And so once Jesus has come, uh, Jesus' baptism, along with Jesus' law, is in effect And that is the one baptism that the New Testament speaks of time and again that is necessary for our salvation. I know we've talked in the Colossians series on this podcast and even again as we've studied through Acts uh, because, you know, the— There are uh, moments when different baptisms are mentioned. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for example, in Acts chapter 2, on the apostles, in Acts chapter 10, on Cornelius and his household. That was a very limited thing, uh, and it was not unto salvation. In fact, Cornelius and his household had to be saved, uh, and thus they had to be baptized, even after (laughs) they had received that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so anyway, having said all of that, uh, you know, the baptism of Christ, that one baptism that Ephesians chapter four speaks of, and, uh, the baptism that, uh, Peter and the apostles pointed, uh, those individuals to from Acts chapter two, and then going forward, we've seen it over and over and over again through the 19 chapters thus far in the book of Acts, uh, was a baptism that connected people with Christ and with the, the saving power of there the blood go. of Christ. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what makes it stand out and stand apart. The, the baptism of John, uh, John's ministry and his baptism, taught people to believe in someone who was to come. Mm-hmm. But the baptism of Jesus is a baptism predicated upon a faith in someone who has come mm-hmm. and truly is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, The baptism of John was a baptism of preparation. The baptism of Jesus is one of transformation. So there's really some major differences here. And there's another major difference 
that Paul capitalized upon in this particular context, and that has to do with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he he connected the Holy Spirit with proper baptism uh, in this particular uh, context. Now, I asked those three questions, and we kind of wrapped our mind around John's ministry and uh, his baptism. Now, talk to me about these seven verses, and I'm going to lean back, and I have my cup of coffee, <laughs> and I'm going to learn. Wow. <laughs> I, see, I, I can't write with this cast on my hand, so oh, I just, have, right, to, right, I, I just right. have to kind of soak it up. I see. Yeah, that's yes. that's what it is. <laughs> Wake me up when you're through. No, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Set your alarm. It won't be long. <laughs> oh my. Well, we find ourselves back in Ephesus. Paul has been to Ephesus before, of course, and so he's just sort of swinging back through. Maybe more to say on Ephesus and on this uh, city of Ephesus when we move into the next section, because maybe some of the background of this city will come more into play in that section of the narrative. But he encounters these men. We found out in verse 7 that there are 12 in all, in all, and they are called disciples. Now, it is true that Dr. Luke uses the term disciples a whole lot to refer to Christians, but the word disciple is not necessarily synonymous with Christian, at least not technically so. Uh, you know, it just means a learner, a student. And so the question becomes, well, a learner or a student or a follower of whom? And I think we get the answer to that in verse 3 when it says, you know, they, they answered Paul's question, which was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their reply is, well, no, we hadn't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And, okay, into what were you baptized? Into John's baptism. And so the implication there is they must be, at least to some degree, disciples of John. At the very least, they're following some of John's prescriptions relative to to baptism, which, as we just said, was preparatory in its nature. It is of interest to look and see the way that Paul uh, unites some concepts. In verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Notice that there's a connection. There's an assumption on Paul's part that uh, based on belief, one would receive the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 3, he expounds on even what belief entails, uh, mm -hmm. into what then were you baptized. And so belief is paired with or inclusive of baptism. And then the result of that in Paul's mind would be a reception of the Holy Spirit, something that these 12 disciples of John say that they had not received. And so John... Uh, G, uh, I'll get him in just a minute. Paul <laughs> proceeds to um, discuss with them about the nature of John's baptism, and then he interest, introduces to them Jesus in verse 4. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized. We could say technically they were baptized again, but the sense, of course, is now they're being baptized into that one baptism, that right. baptism of transformation. They're baptized into Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus that is in accordance with his authority. And consequently, the Holy Spirit came upon them by virtue of Paul's laying on of hands. They began speaking in tongues and prophesying. What we see here is a miraculous nature of uh, a manifestation of that Holy Spirit uh, coming up on them through the miraculous gifts, tongues, speaking in tongues, and prophesying as well. But speaking in tongues is often associated with the Holy Spirit indwelling and empowering believers throughout the book of Acts. We saw it in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius' family. We saw it in Acts chapter 2 with the 12 apostles. But it wasn't just limited to them. In fact, uh, speaking in tongues is among the list of the miraculous spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that were empowered by the Holy Spirit, but were limited in duration. And 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 mm -hmm. make that really clear. So, you know, as I'm sort of stepping back from this a little bit, I think the key concepts we need to take away was uh, are here are individuals who were uh, 
very sincere in what they were doing. They had even, uh, you know, obeyed in the things that they were doing, but they had a limited understanding of the full scope of the gospel. All they knew was part of the story, so to speak, and that was the baptism of John, which was designed to prepare folks for what came next. It's no wonder then that when Paul tells them about what came next, they are so uh, willing to receive it. They do that in obedience. Uh, belief manifests itself through action. That action in specific terms was baptism in the Lord Jesus. And as a result, they received the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so anyway, uh, maybe that helps to kick us off there in Acts oh, 19, one to seven. <laughs> but the point is they were baptized in the name of, of the Lord Jesus. There mm. was a there was a seismic shift yeah. in their belief system uh, and their baptism. Uh, they had yet not even heard about the Holy Spirit. And so there's this major change that comes into the mind, heart, lives of these 12 followers, uh, disciples. And it was something that came because of the name of mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's the name that changes everything. It changed their concepts about discipleship, their concepts about baptism, their concepts about the Holy Spirit. So major shifts in thought and living took place in the lives of 12 people because the name of Jesus was preached in chapter 19 one through seven. I want to go on with verses eight yeah. through 10 and let you comment on that. <laughs> and I'd like to kind of chime in a little. He entered the synagogue. This would be Paul again. And this would be in Ephesus. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading, reasoning, dialegomai, the same thing that he did in Thessalonica, the same thing that he did in Berea, the same thing that he did in Athens. This, this is Paul's modus operandi. He just goes into this gathering together place of religious people and then begins to tit for tat uh, challenge thoughts and reason with them and persuade them, it says, about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn, I've preached to people like that. I'm sure you have too, uh, Robert. When some became stubborn, and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. He's preaching the word of of the Lord. But for my thoughts, and I'll throw it to you, preaching the word of the Lord involved his preaching about the kingdom of God, verse 8. It involved his preaching about the way, which we've learned all the way back in chapter 9 is a synonym for the church as his kingdom. And he preached, uh, to them about the church, the way, and he preached uh, to disciples and to Jews and to Greeks, calling the, the church the kingdom of God and then calling the church the way. They spoke evil of the way. How would they even know to call it the way? Unless that's something that Paul was saying too. He represented the church to them, the people that belong to God, he presented the church to them as something exquisite. It's a kingdom. Then he presented the church to them as something exclusive. Not one of many ways, but the way. So here is an exclusive body of people. Exquisite in nature as the very kingdom that belongs to God. This is what he was preaching as he's preaching to them the way, or rather the word, of about the Lord. He's preaching about Jesus, but he's preaching about the church that belongs to Jesus, this exquisite, exclusive body of people. That's just 
amazing to see how that Paul could not bifurcate Jesus from the church, but put them together in his preaching. And, oh, we need to do the same. Mm-hmm. Thoughts, Robert? Uh, I'm just thinking this is, uh, you know, the way that the Jews responded after this three months of reasoning in the synagogue is kind of par for the course. Mm -hmm. Paul moves. Apparently, he moves not too far away, reasoning daily now in the hall of Tyrannus. Um, You know, there there are some uh, uh, thoughts, you know, maybe uh, this is a lecture hall or a school building. Uh, Tyrannus may, may have been the owner of the hall. He may have been the major teacher in the hall. There are some manuscripts that suggest that uh, Tyrannus uh, taught from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so maybe Paul would pick up some other time from there. You know, the exact details we don't know for sure. But Paul moves somewhere else where people will hear, Jews and Greeks, in fact. And he's going to continue there for two years. Now, Acts chapter 20 will tell us when Paul is meeting with the elders of the church from Ephesus, but they meet in Miletus. He says that he was in Ephesus for some three years. And so we've already had, you know, two years plus three months a little earlier from what we've learned in in the synagogues and anyway, stuff like that. So about three years of time, which will really allow Paul to do some major teaching and to put down roots in many cases in the city of Ephesus. And because Ephesus is such a major hub in the ancient world at that time, The text says in verse 10 that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Um, We're not surprised by that at all. Ephesus was a key city for travel and business, and that would allow Paul's uh, teaching about Jesus to spread throughout the Roman province. Um, uh, People who visited would have the opportunity to hear and things like that, which may be a good time just to note the fact that uh, Ephesus was just such an important area, and that for several reasons. Politically, it was the provincial capital, Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was an important city from that perspective. Economically, all commerce with the interior of Asia Minor would flow through the Ephesian harbor, which, by the way, isn't there anymore. <laughs> uh, if you're watching the video version of this, you'll uh, there's a picture here. This is the theater that we'll spend so much time uh, discussing at the end of this chapter. And then there's this, this road, this marble road that is going out to, uh, you can see a little water standing because it had been raining that day when the picture was taken. But uh, there used to be the waterway that came right up to that point. I've read that it took constant dredging to keep the harbor open. And in the third century, when the city couldn't afford to do that anymore, the harbor silted up and the city eventually died. Uh, Mm. But in Paul's day, that harbor was very much in use. And so economically, Ephesus then was very important as the gateway to the interior of Asia Minor in terms of commerce and religiously. Uh, the city of Ephesus was important, and that because, as we'll find out at the end of chapter 19, great is Diana of the Ephesians, at least in their estimation, the long-lost, as we could say, temple of Diana or Artemis, uh, was uh, uh, the the crown jewel of the Ephesians. And uh, more to say about that here in just a little while. But that's the reason why, when we come to Acts 19 and verse 10, All the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, and it's no wonder that Paul would spend so much time there because this is such an important city in Asia Minor in the New Testament world at the time. And, and Robert, we're talking about one man. Yeah. (laughs) What one man did and what one man did in the face of great opposition. Yeah. God can accomplish so much with one person who will just allow himself, herself, to be totally consumed by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Paul went everywhere preaching the word about the Lord, and look what he accomplished. So we come to verse 11, and in verses 11 to 20, we have the next major section. We read about John and disciples uh, making changes, based upon the name of the Lord. And this name or word of the Lord continually being preached, uh, not just to those 12, but in the synagogue uh, of Ephesus to Jews and to Greeks. But now we come to verses 11 to 20, and we have a delicious paragraph. Uh, (laughs) we're, We're reading about 
Jews and de- and demoniacs. We're reading about this is actually the last um, recorded example of demon possession and exorcism in all of the New Testament, mm. right here in Acts 19. And it's just, you can't read it without chuckling. And so I'm going to um, let you read it, and uh, I'll comment yeah. on it. We can comment on it together. But let's okay. read verses 11 through 20. And again, note the change that takes place and why. Mm. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. The evil spirits came out of them. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, Paul, I recognize, but who are you? The man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. The name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Hmm. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Wow. Uh, If I were to ask you, what does the word confessing mean? What would you say? Uh, well, looking it up in, in you know uh, dictionaries and lexicons and stuff like that, it it means to say the same thing as. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and this is a word we don't use too often: divulging. <laughs> yeah, divulging. G- give me a synonym for that. It, uh, it, it says here in verse eighteen, many of those who were now who were now believers, meaning at one time they weren't. Therefore, change. A number. Uh, it says many of those who were now believers came, confessing, and divulging their practices. Mm-hmm. What on earth? Right. The New King James says telling their practices. Okay. Oh, uh, you know they they're they're uh, talking about the stuff they've been doing. Okay. So they're they're fessing up, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and not only did they fess up, but they uh, devied up. They all of these uh, books and their incantations and so forth, they piled up and burned at great expense yeah. because they had come to believe in Jesus. Now, let's go back and uh, kind of see what we're we're reading here. Some tremendous miracles. Uh, I, I remember the same thing being said about Peter as I said about Paul here with um, handkerchiefs and aprons and and such like, just touching and great miraculous consequences transpired. But verse 11 says, itinerant Jewish exorcists. Don't you love that? (laughs) When I was a boy or a lot younger, before your time, there was a black and white Western called Have Gun, Will Travel. (laughs) And this guy had a card. His name was Paladin, and uh, he was a he was a gun for hire. That actually uh, he was a Robin Hood kind of sort. Oh, you could okay. hire this man to come and defend you against the bad guys. Mm. Have gun, will travel. These guys were have incantations, will travel. <laughs> they were itinerant. Uh-huh. They were traveling Jewish. They were not Christians. Exorcists. They were going through the process of trying to cast out demons. And uh, it says that these itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now, they're not converts to Jesus, but they're using the name of Jesus in their incantations. I wonder why. Maybe they found that their incantations and their bibbidi bobbidi boo wasn't going to do it. It so worked they for had Paul. To, 
It worked. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But Paul did it in the name of the Lord, see? Right. And so yeah. they had to pull in the name of the Lord. And now you've got these seven sons of, of uh, Sceva. So I'm reading about 12 in verses 1 through 7. And now I'm reading about seven. And these seven sons of this Jewish high priest, uh, they came to cast out this demon. And I love what the demon says. Read that to me again. Yeah. Uh, this is just <laughs> perfect. Jesus, I, this is verse 15. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, put that into context because this, the, the Jewish itinerant exorcists were casting out demons in the name of the Lord, and they would say in their incantations, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Mm -hmm. And the word adjure there is keruso, which is the word for proclaim, for proclaim or preach. Mm. And it means to, to act as a herald, to herald a message of authority that must be heard and obeyed. And so these people were actually claiming to have the authority of Jesus in the authority of Jesus come out, but they weren't even connected to the authority of Jesus. That's mm -hmm. what they were. They were heralding the authority of Jesus and didn't have a right to. And so these guys come back and say, now, hold up. I mean, the demon says, Jesus, I know. And his word for know there is gnosko, and it carries this concept of um, detailed knowledge. Mm. It'd be like the knowledge that a father and son share. Uh, I have detailed knowledge of my father. He has of me. And nobody else knows these little, uh, little details, this knowledge. And that's gnosis. That's to gnosko. Well, these guys are saying, the, the demon is saying, uh, we have a detailed knowledge of Jesus. Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. Epitithomy. Um, I, I, I stand over. Uh, I have a, uh, a familiarity with Paul. Now, I know about Jesus in the detail. I know who he is. And I'm familiar with Paul. But who in the world are you? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Uh, well, the evil spirit leaps on them. I like the way the ESV translates it for 16. He mastered them, yes. mastered all of them. Okay. So seven guys against the best we can tell, uh, it's one evil spirit. It's used in the singular throughout mastered all of them overpowered them. We don't really know exactly what all went down, but they're running away <laughs> naked and wounded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, that's what you call a, a major put down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my word. And so the word of this spread throughout Ephesus. And as a result, you had some conversions. I, I love what the, the latter part of verse 17 says. Fear fell upon them all. And here it is, Ro uh, Robert, the name of the Lord. There's that same phraseology that I found all the way back in the first paragraph when Paul baptized them in the name of the Lord. Mm. So I can't get away from the name of the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord. And fear fell upon them all in the name of the Lord, or the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled, literally uh, made to be large. Jesus became larger than life. The name of Jesus became larger than life throughout the city of Ephesus because of this specific event. And then I read about uh, those who were now believers. They converted. Here is the change. So a change took place in this paragraph from individuals um, that uh, were Jews, but converted to Jesus. Individuals who were pagan, but converted to Jesus and threw away all of their incantations to a much uh, loss of revenue, but they did so. And verse 20 says, the word 
of the Lord. The name of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the name of the Lord, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And it's believed that right here might be the time when the uh, churches of Asia were actually established uh, through the missionary efforts of Paul and others. Mm. So we've had change number one with 12 disciples and their coming to proper baptism in the first paragraph. Change number two, as Paul continues to preach the word of the Lord, as uh, individuals throw away all of their uh, pagan books and magic practices and turn to believe in the Lord. And now we're going to come to um, change number three. And this is in, or a call for change at least, mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, section of the book. It's actually the largest. And this is where I read about not uh, Jews who were uh, John's disciples, not Jews and a demoniac, but I read about some jewelers mm -hmm. and a man named Demetrius who was a jeweler. That is, craftsmen who worked with silver. This is rather lengthy, 20 verses. So capsule it for me, Robert, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, uh, so Demetrius the silversmith, according to verse 24, uh, specifically he made silver shrines of Artemis. And so uh, you mentioned earlier that the, the message of the gospel and the fact that we now have you know, Jewish individuals who are turning, we've got this message about Jesus, uh, we've got the, the fear of individuals who are turning, and the word of the Lord is prevailing, all of because, you know, this message about the, the demoniacs and the demons being exorcised and all of that. Uh, and then we've got individuals who are coming and, and uh, confessing the sins of practicing the magical arts and things like that in verse 19. All of this is now having an economic impact on Ephesus, and specifically silversmiths like Demetrius, who mm -hmm. gathers a bunch of craftsmen together uh, uh, in verse 25 and following and begins to stir up the crowds a little bit. You guys know we, we build our wealth from this, and uh, it, not just in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia. And now Paul is traveling throughout all these places, or people are coming here and hearing Paul and taking it back there and turning a great many people away. And specifically the end of verse 26, they're saying Paul's teaching, gods made with hands are not gods. Well, this that is had a, to sting. this hurts. And in fact, Demetrius confesses that in verse 27, there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but <laughs> also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis or Diana will be counted as nothing. This could affect not just us, not just our livelihood, but this city that we know and love. And so the response is the people are enraged. They begin crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They, they get the whole city in this uproar, and they all rush in to the uh, Ephesian theater and uh, begin to chant and be in confusion. You know, the text says later on in Acts 19 that some of the crowds don't even know why, you know, they're, they're thinking, uh, well, you know, what exactly is going on or why they are in there. They just know that they are mad. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine standing in front of all that, those people, right. Paul, and hearing the, all, all this ruckus going on? Uh, you, you've, you've said the temple of Diana, mm -hmm. and then you said the temple of Artemis. Yeah. It, it might be good for us to um, pause for a moment and remind ourselves that Diana would be the Latin and Artemis would be the Greek use. Mm -hmm. uh, so same goddess, if you please. It was their goddess of fertility, by the way. And um, it, it's just whether that you were referring to her with uh, a Latin term or a Greek term. But this was a, this was a major religious center. It was known, I think later on, uh, in the same chapter, uh, verse 35, it's actually called, uh, Ephesians or Ephesus is called uh, the temple keeper yeah. of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. 
Could you comment on that sacred stone that fell from the sky? Well, best we can tell, uh, uh, maybe a, a, a meteorite or something like that, that they believed had been sent from the gods. And uh, 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 anyway, uh, therefore, um, you know, g- giving them, I'm having trouble choking it out here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this this stone that had fallen from the sky and uh, what is it by which Diana had come or at uh-huh. least had sent them this this word uh, fallen maybe perhaps near uh, there at Ephesus and so therefore Ephesus be, uh, becomes uh, the, the the temple keeper Diana or Artemis becomes the patron goddess of the city I mean uh, you know we we talked a few weeks ago when we were over in Athens from Acts 17 that there was a a uh, temple with Athena over there. I mean, it was not uncommon to have patron gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just that, that Diana was something that uh, Ephesus had exclusive rights to, but, uh, because of this, what they believed in their ancient mythology, the sacred stone that Mm -hmm. had fallen, uh, they believed that Ephesus was of special interest to Artemis or Diana and therefore vice versa <laughs> artemis or diana was of special interest to them as well when i was a boy uh, i was fascinated by the black and white rendition of a movie called the day the earth stood still perhaps you've seen it maybe you've mm-hmm. seen the the newer version but this spaceship comes down and then of course an alien steps out in bodily form and uh, kind of in concept that's what we're reading about here a meteorite falls yeah. and uh, they claim that it has come from the gods and so here is um Diana or Artemis, their goddess of fertility, that exists because the gods have sent this meteorite, this spaceship, if you please, mm. uh, to where else but Ephesus. And so it is the temple keeper of um, of the goddess Diana. Or that Artemis. temple was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it, it is interesting that today uh, archaeologists have a general idea, but emphasis on general, of where it would have been. There are virtually no ruins of it that, that anyone can really uh, uh, tell anything about. We know that it had 127 columns, each measuring 60 feet in height. Uh, and uh, at That's the crazy. center, yeah, and at the center of all of that was a statue of Diana and uh, depicted in such a way that, that it was clear she's the fertility goddess, yes. uh, things like that. So anyway, you know, this was a really important thing that the temple of Artemis uh, was set just a little outside of the city center, if you will. Um, and boy, you want to talk about, uh, temple prostitutes and just on and on and on. Yeah. And, and we're not talking about a little building here. This, right. this building yeah, was huge. like, it was like two thirds the size of a football field wide and uh, a football field and a quarter long. And those columns that you talked about, we all read about, we we hear about the red zone on a football field for the 20 yards before the the, uh, touchdown. These columns were 20 yards high. Mm. So this is more than a, it's kind of like a football field long with all of these hundred, how many? 127? 127, yeah. 127 columns that are 20 uh, yards, 20 yards high. This is a massive yeah. structure. I've read that, that it was the largest building in Rome, Greece, or Asia, four times the size of Athens Parthenon. <laughs> it was and huge. the Apostle Paul, one man, stands in that city and yeah. preaches a message that says, you have built that to honor something that doesn't even exist. Mm. Your God is no God at all. That took some courage. Yeah, it did. But that's what someone just totally consumed by Jesus is willing to do for Jesus. Call for the change that's needed. Now, in this last 20 verses, this last paragraph, I never read the word Jesus, and I never read the word Lord. But there is a connection, I think, Robert. When we come here to verse 26, Demetrius said, You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, 
this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods. Focus on those words in almost all of Asia and go back to verse 10. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. What is Paul preaching throughout Asia? He's preaching the word about Jesus. And here in Ephesus, preaching about Jesus was a message that called upon individuals to recognize their gods as no gods and change them, replace them for the true Son of God, Jesus. That was his message again, a message about Jesus, the name of Jesus that called for change. We don't read about a whole lot of change on uh, the part of these individuals here in the last couple of paragraphs. But um, it was Paul's message all the same. The name that will change everything. In application, I guess we could say, uh, there's a lot today that is said about baptism. There's some that tell me that all I have to do is just come to an intellectual belief in Jesus, pray a prayer that confesses sins, invite him into my life as my Lord, and I'm saved. And they kind of escort baptism out of the whole process and be baptized to follow his example and prove that you're saved. I find nothing like that in the New Testament. It is rather a baptism predicated upon faith and repentance for the forgiveness of sins, of course, through the shed blood of Jesus. But all of this debate about baptism, you know, I should be willing to change and be baptized the way the Bible teaches me to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And I should be moved to do that because of my zeal for Jesus, if for no other reason. We, we relegate this into religious debate, and we, we map out debate propositions for the negative and for the positive. And why don't we just become eaten alive with Jesus to the point that we want to capitalize on his own words. He that believes and, and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. I could say an application of these paragraphs that, um, you know, believing in Jesus and being consumed by Jesus is the secret to me overcoming the demons, figuratively speaking, the demons in my life. We all have them. We all have our spiritual, if not emotional, psychological struggles. Jesus is the key to overcoming those. I don't mean to be coy, but if we come to be totally consumed by Jesus the Christ, it will help us overcome our addictions. It will help us replace our sorry and sore attitudes with those that are more like the heart of our Lord. So belief in being a disciple of Jesus can, can help me exorcise the figurative demons in my own life. And, of course, if we were to apply the last couple of paragraphs, um, being consumed by Jesus will escort any idolatry away from my heart and my life. And even though we might not have idols in our houses, every one of us, if we're not careful, have houses full of idols. They may not be an idol like uh, uh, the goddess Athenia, in the Parthenon, or like uh, the goddess Artemis Diana here in Ephesus. But we have our houses full of idols, if I understand the book of Colossians, where he says covetousness is idolatry. It's wanting all of this stuff 
in life and living for all of this stuff in life, letting all of this stuff in life replace Jesus in our hearts. That's idolatry. But if I'm consumed with a zeal for Jesus, it helps me get my values and priorities in place and escort all of that idolatry away. So um, we truly need to follow the example of Apollos and be individuals who are willing to make changes because of Jesus, who are driven to the scriptures to see more that we can find out about Jesus, to have a spirit that's literally on fire for Jesus, wanting to study the Bible and connect the dots to see this passage as it relates to Jesus and our being like Jesus, and expect sermons that take us to Jesus. Jesus. Preach sermons that remind people of Jesus. It is Jesus, blessed Jesus. And it is a message that is not segmented from the kingdom, the way, the church, and how Christians are to live, but one that literally encapsulates it and makes it truly fleshed out as it should be. Well, I think I got up on a soapbox. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I just want no, us great. to know so so much that Jesus is the focus of a fervent spirit. Mm. And I need to wonder, am I in the fire or is the fire in me? Mm. Back to you, Robert. Help us spread the word about today with Jesus. You know, uh, Jesus is uh, counter to uh, idolatry in any form, covetousness, things like that. He will challenge those uh, things that may be culturally normal, uh, but at the same time, and what we're seeing here is that he's so much better than those things. Mm. He's got greater power than those things, and so we're we're always right to place our trust in him and to have our our uh, fire lit by him and, mm-hmm. and to continually uh, fan those flames by drawing closer and closer to him. Well, that's what this podcast is all about. As you know, thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ is where you can learn more. If you need to go back and catch up, maybe you want to go back and revisit some of those episodes from Acts, or we've got a whole other series on Colossians we've done, and then two seasons we did on Mark. And, uh, you know, we, we did some questions and answers. What would Jesus say in this situation or that? Go check those out on our website, thelightnetwork.tv slash TWJ. You can subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube just by searching for the name of the show, Today with Jesus. Uh, and uh, help us spread the word about this. Uh, share this with somebody you love. Help us spread the word about Jesus. Uh, that's what we're trying to do here on our podcast. Amen. Amen. Every Tuesday is when you can expect a new episode. Uh, We take breaks at the end of the year and in the middle of the year during the summertime, but otherwise uh, we have two seasons a year. And so uh, we find ourselves in the first season of 2023, if you're following along with us sequentially or chronologically, and uh, we right here in the middle of this. So we've got more to come. This is season seven, episode eight, as you're looking it up for archive purposes later on and we're going to find ourselves in Acts chapter 20, which consequently becomes a very important chapter as we think about the example of the early church yes. and uh, what we do today and why we do some of the things that we do. And we're going to see there, too, that it was and, all based in the Jesus they knew. Right. I, and I even see an example of how people have responded to my preaching uh. with this man named Eutychus <laughs> who, who went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no oh, comment. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so tune in. Be here for season seven, episode nine for that. Get your good nap. <laughs> hey, oh, thanks for being God. with us today. We're so glad you've been a part of this. I've enjoyed it. Hope I to see to, you Robert. next episode. Thanks. God bless everybody. <laughs>